It is uh, my pleasure and an honor to be here for the second session. This is not only a big conference, but an international conference, and this session is uh, one of perhaps the, the uh, most international. So we're starting, even though people are still uh, coming in, just to keep things uh, going as best we can. Uh, the main speaker of this session is Paul Rateau uh, from the University of Paris, but more specifically from the University of Paris uh, 1, uh, Panthéon Sorbonne. And the title of his talk is The Theoretical Foundations of the Leibnizian Theodicy and Its Apologetic Aim. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to thank uh, Sam and Michael for their kind, very kind uh, invitation and for its uh, wonderful organization. So I will start my, my paper, page two, <clears throat> in order to have time to, to say all what I, I want to say. So in this paper, I would like to focus on the theoretical foundations of Leibniz theodicy and emphasize the problems raised by this doctrine of divine justice, a doctrine Leibniz is reluctant to call a science in its own right. More particularly, I would like to answer a very simple question. Why does Leibniz tackle the problem of evil? Or, to be more precise, why does the resolution of that problem require what he calls, he creates, the word on purpose, a theodicy? As you know, Leibniz is the inventor of the neologism, theodicy. Leibniz tackles the problem of evil both for external and internal reasons. What I call external reasons are historical circumstances. Leibniz feels concerned by the increase of atheism and skepticism in his time. He knows very well that the experience of evil is one of the main arguments used by those like Bale, who question the, the idea of providence. But he considers also that, on the side of the defense, the cause of God is not always well pleaded. The theologians, like the Rutilians, who conceive God as a despot rather than a good king, as a tyrant who acts by caprice, selon son bon plaisir, damage authentic piety. How could we love a God who seems to dispense goods and evils in an arbitrary way, damns and saves without any reason? These external reasons are of practical nature and have to do with religious and apologetic considerations. However, I believe they would not have been sufficient if they had not met some internal reasons. What I call internal reasons have to do with Leibniz's own philosophical concerns. They are related to, the, to a demand of systematic coherence. I mean that the, recon the conciliation of the, the absolute perfection of God with evil is in fact a metaphysical requirement for a philosopher who admits the, the three following cases. The first one is theological. According to Leibniz, the power of God is always subordinated to his wisdom. His absolute independence and freedom do not imply he could decide and act without considering any law or rule. God always acts according to wisdom, goodness, and justice, never in an arbitrary manner, even if we are unable to understand all the reasons of his providence. Generally speaking, we can affirm that God does not permit any evil to occur in the world unless he knows that a good will occur thanks to it. But this does not necessarily mean we are able to identify this good in particular. The second thesis is closely linked to the first. It is an epistemic one. Truths, notions, principles are universal and unequivocal. What is good, just, wise, and true for man who makes good use of his reason is good, just, wise, and true for every rational being, God included. God does not establish as Descartes thought, God and evil, right and wrong, 
nor the rational truths of mathematics, logic, and metaphysics. All these notions are uncreated and eternal. They are parts of God's thought so that, for Leibniz, as you know, it would be absurd to claim that they might be created by God. It would imply that God could be the author of his own understanding, that is to say, the author of himself. The third thesis, Leibniz's defense, is a consequence of the second one. It asserts the fundamental conformity of faith with reason. Faith and reason are two authentic sources of truth, but not two orders of truth. Rational and religious truths are all consonant, conform, as Leibniz says, which means that they have the same form. They are truth in the same way and in the same sense, so that they could not be in contradiction. Even if some of the dogmas revealed by the Holy Scripture surpass our faculty of, under of understanding, they form with the truth or finite spirit can understand a unique and continuous chain. This chain is called universal reason or the divine intellect. What faith teaches may be above reason, never against reason. And reason means that here of finite reason which contains a limited portion of truth. Nothing could be contrary to our reason, the part, without being contrary to reason, the will. The question of the unity of truth is primordial because the possibility of a justification of God by reason depends on it. Actually, the, the attempt to defend God against the objection of evil would definitely be compromised if reason and faith were in contradiction. In a Christian context, we have to be sure that all that rational theology proves is not contradicted by revealed theology. What value would a discourse based solely on the idea of God arising naturally from reason have if all its propositions and arguments could be overthrown by revelation? Leibniz starts his essays with a preliminary dissertation on the conformity of faith with reason because this conformity this conformity is absolutely required. Nothing less than the success of his entire project depends on this conformity. So these three main theses, the subordination of power to wisdom, the university and the unity of truth, the, the identity of the principles of justice in God and in human beings entail some obligations at the theoretical level. They are very demanding in that they prevent anyone who admits them from avoiding or eluding the, the objection of evil. There is no way now to dismiss the reproaches leveled against providence on the pretext that we would not have any pertinent idea of what is just for God or on the pretext that his absolute preeminence would by definition, put him above every law. These three theses suppose that no reproach, no complaint against God is inadmissible as a matter of principle, even if, of course, Leibniz will show that no reproach, no complaint against God is well-founded, in fact. As God must be subject to the rules of universal jurisprudence, just as every other spirit is. In other words, the indictment of God before the judgment of reason is possible in principle. To be sure, God is not subordinated to any superior to whom he should be accountable, and strictly speaking, he owes man nothing. Nevertheless, it is his duty, quotation, to justify himself before himself as a wise sovereign. He is responsible to his wisdom for his actions, and what he owes to his wisdom, that is to say to himself, is nothing but what he owes to any spirit who uses reason. Therefore, questions such as, why is there evil if God is good? 
If he is almighty, was he unable to avoid it? Does the existence of sin mean he wanted sin to be committed? Are questions that could not be rejected on the pretext we are not allowed to judge God and unable to understand his hands? Answering this question with a blunt refusal is, I quote, cutting the Gordian knot instead of untying it. It is a way of solving a problem by denying its existence. And this approach is exactly contrary to Leibniz, for whom the explanation of evil and the justification of God are legitimate demands. They are demands of reason that every theology that assumes university has to justify, has to satisfy, sorry. Thus, Leibniz faces the problem of evil without evading the issue. It remains to be seen how he tackles the problem. Why does he link it to the theme of justice, and to be more precise, with the theme of the justice of God? What explains this juridical and theological approach? It is true that Leibniz is a jurist and that his intellectual background is Christian. Evil is for him necessary thought within the context of Christianity. But these reasons are not sufficient, of course. Leibniz tackles evils from a juridical point of view because he regards injustice as the fundamental evil. By injustice, I mean everything that violates the law. The committed injustice, offense seen, as well as the suffered injustice, physical pain and moral grief for all that are unmerited. For Leibniz, it is not the existence of suffering in itself, nor the fact that there are calamities, misfortunes, and even wicked people in our world that is shocking. What raises a problem is that the good man suffers, that the just man is persecuted, that the criminal commits his crime with impunity and even seems to be rewarded by the happiness he gains. Evil is not a scandal in itself. It is shocking when it seems to be unjustly distributed, when the pain falls to one who does not merit it, when the sin is not followed by any punishment and is even profitable to one who has committed it. Evil is an evil in so far as it means an intolerable, sorry again, contradiction between fact and right. The right order of things seems to be turned upside down. The moral good virtue is joined to the physical evil suffering, the moral evil sin to the physical good pleasure, whereas the moral good should be connected with the physical good, its reward, and the moral evil with the physical evil, its punishment. The question is therefore the following. How is this disorder possible under a God, a God who is said to be good, wise, and almighty? The justice of God is here directly concerned in its two senses, insofar as it can refer both to law and to a perfection. On the one hand, divine justice is the rule according to which God governs the whole universe and in particular, the Republic of the Spirits, giving rewards and punishments to each according to his merits. That's the first sense of justice for uh, Joseph of God for Leibniz. On the other hand, it means perfection, holiness, which is the supreme degree of goodness. In accordance with his holiness, God always wants and does what is good. And we find exactly the same distinction Considering the human justice, of course, because justice means a way of governing an institution in the human society, as well as the virtue of the just man, who returns to each what is due to him. So, the apparent disorder of things, for example, the prosperity of some evil men and the misfortune of sundry good people, raises a question about divine justice taken in the first sense. 
The idea of providence in the world is challenged on that point.